them. Have you ever been in a situation where you dealt with someone and you had this feeling, I thought you were a Christian. Like, how could you do this? I, th I thought you were a Christian. Um, the, another example might be uh, forging a document or lying in a situation. Or maybe it's somebody cheating in order to stay competitive, whether that's in a business or in a sports arena. And you think, why wouldn't this person act like a Christian? Have you, ever, have you guys ever experienced that? People that claim to be Christians and then you, you look at what they do and you, they don't match up? Doesn't match up? David Kinnaman is the author of a book called You Lost Me. And he spent five years presenting to Christian leaders about the perceptions of Christians by non-Christians. And he has another book called Unchristian. And he writes this. He says, in the research for that book project, our team discovered that 84% of, non, of young non-Christians say they know a Christian personally. So these are non-Christians, people that claim to be non-Christian. 84% of them say they know a Christian. But only 15% of them say their lifestyles of those believers are noticeably different in a good way. Isn't that crazy? 84% of these non-Christians say, I know a Christian. And only 15% of them identified that there was a difference between this Christian's behavior and anybody else in a good way. Why don't Christians look any different? Than the world, not all Christians, but why don't many or some, well, at least say some, why don't some Christians look different than the world does? I think the answer in part is this they don't see the real Jesus in his glory. And one of the ways that we can see transformation and true Christian behavior is to see Jesus more clearly to know who he is, to see his glory, and experience the splendor of Jesus Christ. And when we see that, when we understand that, that is a transforming power in our lives that is seen by other people. The sermon topic today is, How is Jesus Glorious? How is Jesus Glorious? I already told you where we're going. We're in Mark chapter 9. This is the transfiguration. Mark chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. In this, uh, I'll give you a little preview of the sermon. We're going to see that Jesus is glorious because he is the Son of God. We're going to see Jesus is glorious. He's greater than Moses. Jesus is glorious because he is our Savior. And Jesus is glorious because he makes our glorification possible. If you're able to stand, please stand with me as we read Mark 9, verses 1 through 13. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it's come with power. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses. And they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it, it's good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He didn't know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he said to them, 
Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written the Son of Man that of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and he did, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, the country singer Clint Black, you guys know who Clint Black is? Yeah? Uh, all the Texas people know. Yeah, we know. Uh, Clint Black was talking to Chet Atkins. He has, a, he has an album out, and he did a little ode to Chet. One of his songs is Ode to Chet Atkins. And they're both amazing guitarists, but Chet Atkins is the master. I mean, he is one of the greatest pickers. And... Uh, Chet Atkins was talking to him, and he said, you know, where did you steal that, that riff from? Like, where did you get that from? He goes, I don't know. I've forgotten where I've gotten all my things from. And Clint Black says to him in this little interview, well, that's good. If you're going to steal something, you should forget where you got it from. <laughs> not good advice. Kids, that's not the sermon. Don't go home and say, so Pastor John said we should forget where we steal things from. I think a better practice is to remember where you got something from and to attribute it if you get the work from others. Following that principle, I just want to tell you that a lot of my sermon, a lot of the thoughts and ideas that I have, have come from David Platt. He, he preached a sermon last summer at McLean Bible Church. It's from June 12th, and I give it to you. I commend it to you. You can listen to that this week. It's awesome. And, uh, and he really helped me as I went through commentaries. I studied the Greek read through things, but his sermon really brought things to light um, in this passage. So I leaned on him, and I just want to let you know that um, to, tonight, and I recommend that you, you listen. But let's dive into this passage and look first at the connection between these first two verses in chapter 9. Chapter 9, 1 says this, Truly there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it's come with power. Jesus is talking to his disciples. We've just come out of last week's sermon. He told them there's going to be some rough days. The Son of Man, He Himself, Jesus, saying, "I'm going to be. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die, and on the third day rise again." And then He tells the disciples, "But some of you will not die until before you see the kingdom of God and the Son of Man, Kingdom of God as it's come with power." I don't think it's a coincidence that Mark puts that verse 1, and now, the, you know the chapters and the verses are not in the, Old, the New Testament, right? Mark, when, they, when he wrote this, he didn't say, okay, chapter 9, verse 1, chapter 9, verse 2. He, he wrote the Gospel of Mark. And then we, the church, went through and we broke it down and we gave it chapters and, and verses. Some people put this with the, the group before because he's talking to the disciples and this this verse comes in this the esv and a, probably your translation puts this in chapter 9 verse 1 and it ties in with verse 2 what happens right after he says that you will see the kingdom of god after it's come with power the transfiguration how are we going to see the kingdom of god with power they're going to see jesus in a glorified state in power. <clears throat> and that's what we see in this passage. And I think the overarching theme of this passage is the glory of Jesus Christ. The glory of Jesus Christ. Um, this is after six days after he said this, he took with him Peter, James, and John. It's interesting that this would be in the same chapter because he says this, and then it says six days later, after six days, really this may be the seventh day, they're with him. Now, there will be more of Jesus coming in power. There was more when Jesus rose from the dead. He came in power. He is coming back again. Amen? Jesus is coming back again. When he comes back again, we will hear a trumpet sound. We will be caught up with him in the air. And it says, Thessalonians, we'll be with him forever. But he will come in glory and in power. So there's more to come. But part of the 
prophecy, part of what Jesus said is the kingdom seen in glory, is fulfilled here in the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. This passage ultimately highlights the glory of Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at all these aspects of the glory of Jesus Christ that are here. But before we, we dig even further into this, I want to read from 2 Peter 1.17. You can just jot that down in your notes, or if you're a really fast turner, you can turn there. 2 Peter 1.17. Peter. 2 Peter. Who wrote 2 Peter? Peter wrote 2 Peter. Okay? One of these three guys that was there and saw Jesus transfigured in this mount. Peter, James, and John. Peter wrote this. He said, For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Peter remembered this. This stuck with him. And he says, Jesus received glory from the Father. He was glorified. We saw it. We heard it. We heard the voice say, this is my son. And we were with him on that holy mountain. Well, what is glory? What is glory? Glory comes from two words in the Bible. The Old Testament, you know, is written in Hebrew. The, the word for glory is kaved. Kaved. It has to do with weight. To be weighty, to have some substance, to have some gravitas, to have weight. Now, things that are fluff, that, that have no weight, that are of no consequence, those are not important things. But things that matter, they have weight. And, and God, when we say that he has honor, he has glory, he has weight. The second verb or word that we have here for glory is from the New Testament. And that, that you probably know, doxa, doxa, we get doxology from that, right? And that, that, it talks about the brightness, splendor, radiance. It also has to do with greatness and splendor. And, and thirdly, honor as a recognition of status. So when we're talking about the glory of Jesus, we're talking about weight, the gravitas, the importance, the significance of Jesus Christ, the splendor, the majesty of Jesus Christ, and just by his position and who he is, the recognition of Jesus' status. And this passage is filled with ways that Jesus is glorious. The first one is that Jesus is glorious because he is the Son of God. I, I think that, that we need to start there. It's not the first verse in this passage, but I think that's where we need to start. Jesus is God. Jesus is the Son of God. Now, we believe that God exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus is fully God. He has always existed as God. He is God. He is the Son of God. Read with me in verse... Um, Five, starting with verse 5, it says, And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good that we're here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. For he didn't know what to say, for they were terrified. Leave it to Peter, when he doesn't know what to say, to jump in there and say something anyway, right? Thank goodness, Peter, because, you know, make me feel better. <laughs> Peter. I'm sure in his report card it said, talks too much in class, right? Peter. <laughs> comes up with some crazy ideas. It comes up with some amazing ideas, too. Who was the one that just last time got it right last week? Peter, who are you? You are the Christ, the Son of God. Ding, 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 ding. Good job, Peter. And then he says, wait a minute. Don't do this. He says, get behind me, Satan. Oh, oops. Now here, he puts his foot in the mouth again. He's like, Let, okay, there's Jesus. There's Elijah. There's Moses. Yeah, we'll make three tents because I don't know what to say. We'll make some tents for all three of you. And here's what happens. A cloud overshadowed them. A voice comes out of the cloud, said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly there's no one else but Jesus. We see the preeminence of Jesus. We see his status. 
He is the Son of God. The Father speaks from heaven. A cloud comes over him, and the others are gone. And he says, no, don't get this wrong, Peter, James, John. It's not, okay, there are three prophets. No, there's one Son of God, Jesus. He has glory in who he is, his status as being God, the Son of God. He is splendorous. He is he has splendor. He has glory because of who he is, his position as the Son of God. And they get it right. <laughs> they see his glory here. Hebrews 1 3. Remember the beginning of Hebrews? Hebrews, if you don't know much about Hebrews, Hebrews talks all about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. He is supreme. He is greater than and fill in the blank. You have priests, he's greater than the priests. We have sacrifices, he is the sacrifice, the greatest sacrifice. <coughs> Jesus is the preeminent one. And in Hebrews 1 3, it says, Jesus, he is the radiance of the glory of God. The exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty <coughs> on high. Jesus is the Son of God, and because he's the Son of God, he's full of glory. These guys got to see a glimpse of it. Peter, James, and John. So Jesus has glory because he is God. He's the Son of God. Look at verse 4. I'm going backwards, but verse 4. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Second point is Jesus is more glorious than both Moses and Elijah. They disappeared, right? When, the, when they said, oh, let's make three tents. No, they disappeared. The Father says, no, Jesus, he is my Son. That he is the Son of God. Jesus is more glorious than Moses. Now, there are some amazing connections between this passage and the Old Testament. And maybe in your head, you read this and you, you started thinking through like, oh, man, this is just like this and this and this. One of the things this is just like is Exodus 24. So I do want you to take, put, you know, put something here. You can probably find Mark 9 again if you need to, but... Go back to Exodus 24. So Genesis, Exodus, second book of the Bible. We are going to see where Moses interacts with God. Do you remember that? When Moses got the Ten Commandments, when they, are, they come out of Egypt, and they're in the wilderness, and they go up where? Where does God meet with Moses? On a mountain. Where were, where were these cats? On a high mountain. Many times, God reveals his glory. God meets us in mountains. That's why we live here in Western Slope, near the San Juans. Okay? God meets his people in these mountains. But he met Moses, and some of the... As we read through this, I hope you're going to go, Oh, check, 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 ding, 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 ding. This all makes sense. Look at all these similarities between what happened on this mountain, Trans Transfiguration and Moses. Exodus 24, verse 12. So Exodus 24, verse 12. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait here, wait there, that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I've written for their instruction. So Moses rose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, wait here for us until we return to you. Behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. Verse 15. Then Moses went up to the mountain. The cloud covered the mountain. Have we seen that in our passage? The cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt in the mountain Sinai, and the cloud covered it how many days? Six days. After six days of saying he's going to see the glory... He appeared on the Mount Transfiguration. And here, after six days, the seventh day, he called Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now, the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud, went up on the mountain, and he was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. 
Jump all the way down to verse 29 of chapter 34. So go down to chapter 34. So we were in 24. Go ahead, 10 chapters to Exodus 34, 29. Exodus 34, 29 says, When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets and the testimony in his hand, he came down from the mountain. Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone. They were afraid to come near him. This brightness, this glory of God shone from Moses' face. Six days, after six days that Jesus says, you'll see, they, they'll die. Before they die, they'll see the glory of the kingdom of God. Then he is, on the seventh day, they see Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. A cloud came over Jesus. It says that, G that God came over as a cloud over the mountain. They're both on a mountain. And then the glory of Jesus, his, it's bright, shining splendor. And you see the glory of God reflected in Moses' face. But lest you think that Moses is on the same level, kind of like Peter did. Yeah, we got Moses. That's awesome. Let's, let's, let's kind of worship Moses and Elijah and Jesus. No, 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 no. <clears throat> Hebrews 3, 3 says this. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. As much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. <laughs> Moses is like the house that's being built Jesus is building that house. He is the builder. Jesus, as we know, at first point, Jesus is the son of God. He has glory and splendor and position and status because he is the son of God. And he is more glorious than Moses and Elijah, but in this case, than Moses. But you know Peter, James, and John were familiar with the story about the reception of of the Ten Commandments. This isn't one of those sub-stories, you know, in the minor prophets that nobody reads and nobody knows. This is Exodus. This is the core of getting the, the law from God. And they are thinking, they're seeing this, oh my goodness, Moses on the mountain again, the glory of God, the, the cloud over top, the, the shining, the splendor of Jesus, they're getting it. And then they get that all of that Moses, Elijah, they just pointed to Christ. Their role, any of the splendor that Moses had, was to point people to the Savior, to the one who was going to come, to Jesus, who he, and he has all the glory. Jesus is more glorious than Moses. Well, as I read this, and it talked about Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus. Did you think, like, what are they talking about? Yes. So about the Super Bowl coming up, maybe? I don't know. They, what are they talking about? So, Jesus, what would you have for lunch today? You know, um, how many fish did you turn into uh, feed the 5,000 this time? You know, what are they talking about? Well, luckily, we have two other Gospels that help us to inform our story. And in Luke 9.30... Luke 9.30, it says this. And behold, two men were talking with him, with Jesus. This is the same story, Mount of Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Moses and Elijah already knew. They were privy <laughs> They, they already knew what Jesus was doing. They already knew that at the middle of chapter 8, we said Jesus turned from Galilee and his eyes are focused on Jerusalem and he is headed to the cross. And they knew this and they're talking to Jesus about this. Now, the word for departure in the original language in Greek is the word exodus. Moses, who was the first leader of the Exodus out of slavery, out of bondage, to free people, is talking to Jesus about his Exodus that he's going to lead, freedom and bondage from sin. 
that he's going to accomplish in Jerusalem through his death and his resurrection. That's what they're talking about. Jesus has already told the disciples about this. Once he left Galilee and his face is towards Jerusalem, he's telling them about this. He's telling them not to tell everyone about it, but listen, I'm going to die, and I am going to be raised on the third day. And the reason for that is to pay for the sins of man and to set them free as God used Moses and the plagues to set the people free from Egypt. I am going to set the people free from their sin. And that exodus, that departure is going to happen in Jerusalem. That's what they're talking to Jesus about. Jesus is glorious because he is our Savior. He's the Son of God. He's greater than, he, than Moses and greater than Elijah, but he is our Savior. And that's what they're talking about. Jesus, you're going to, what are you going to do? What's going to, and I don't know if Jesus is telling them the whole story or they already knew it and they're there talking with him. But it says in Luke 9.30 that that's what they're talking about. His departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Philippians 2.5, I think, is one of the best summaries of what Christ did as our Savior. Philippians 2.5 says, Have this mind among yourselves, which was in yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not e count equality with God a thing to be grasped, emptied himself. Taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." God, Jesus has glory because he's our Savior. He was given glory when he accomplished all of that in Jerusalem on the cross for us on our behalf. He already has glory as the Son of God. He's more glorious than Moses and Elijah. And he is glorious because he is our Savior. And when these guys hear the voice of the Father saying, this is my Son from the cloud. They turn around, they look around, they see no one but Jesus. There's no one else but Jesus. So they come down the mountain. Jesus charges them not to tell anyone what they've seen yet. It's not time yet. He says, until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. So they keep the matter to themselves. But they're questioning, why do the scribes say Elijah must come first? And Jesus says him, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And he says, but I tell you, Elijah has come. What's he talking about there? Once again, we're going to look at an, another gospel that helps to inform us of this. In Matthew's account of the same passage, Matthew 17, 13, Matthew says this, Then the disciples understood he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. Thank goodness. Sometimes the Bible keeps a bit of mystery and we don't quite know. And other times we get the answer clearly. What's he talking about here when Elijah has come? He's talking about John the Baptist. The end, what's the last book in the Old Testament? Malachi. Malachi. How many verses are in the last chapter of the last book? of the, the Old Testament. Five verses. There are only five verses in Malachi 4, chapter 4. And this is the last verse of Malachi 4, verse 5. It says this, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts and fathers of hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of other destruction. End of the Old Testament. That's it. That's the last verse of the Old Testament. I will send you Elijah. There are 400 years of silence. Silence. There are no prophets in the land. God doesn't speak. Nothing happens. 
John the Baptist is born. Then Jesus is born. We, we've been through this. Mark 1. What, who is the forerunner that sets the stage for Jesus to come? John the Baptist. And he comes in the power and the spirit of Elijah to make straight the way of the Lord. And Jesus is saying, Elijah has come. And in Matthew, we find out specifically, that's John the Baptist. Now, it's not Elijah himself. It's a prophet that comes in the power and the spirit of Elijah. We see Elijah came back, and he's there with, the, with Moses and Jesus. But John the Baptist is the one that Jesus is talking about. He came. So that's the last verse in the Old Testament. What's the first book of the New Testament? Matthew. And what's it start off with? Matthew 1, 1, the book, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And in Matthew 3, who prepares the way of the Lord? It's John the Baptist. So the Old Testament ends with the promise that Elijah is going to come. And then John the Baptist comes and sets the stage for Jesus to come. Jesus is glorious because he's the son of God. He's more glorious than Moses and Elijah. He's glorious because he's our Savior. And the last one, he is glorious so that we might be glorified and conformed to the image of Christ. Now, we have to, we have to be careful with this last point. What I'm not saying is that we become like God. That we become God's. Do you know that that is one of the philosophies within the Mormon church? There's a phrase that one of their writings says is that as man is, God once was, and as God is, man can become. In other words, you can become a God of your own universe and kind of start your reign and kingdom. No, that's not, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about us becoming like God in that sense. We're not talking about us becoming God. There's one God of the universe. He has always existed. He exists now, and he always will exist. You and I are cre creatures. We were made. We were made in his image. And we will never be God. But the Bible does say that you, as a Christian, are being transformed. You are being conformed into the image of Christ. And that as you behold the glory of God, as you put your eyes on Jesus, as you see Christ for who he is, you become like him. One day... Couple verses, 2 Corinthians 3:18, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Just like they did. They saw Jesus and they were transformed. When we see Jesus for who he is, the reality of who he is, the truth of who he is, the Son of God. We are changed. We are transformed. We can't help but be transformed. Philippians 3.21 says this, Who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Hebrews 2.10 It was fitting that he, God, for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. So what is this glorification I'm talking about? Well, let me read this, this sentence by um, Gerald Bray, who's a professor at Beeson Divinity School. He says, The glorification of the Christian is that we shall share in God's glory when we are in our resurrected bodies in the new heavens and new earth, experiencing deeper fellowship with God and not being at risk of falling away into sin, God's glory finally being all in all. It's not that we change to be from people to God, no, but we become more like him. 
And thank goodness we're going to receive resurrection bodies, just like Christ has a had a resurrection body. He was the first of many to be born again into the resurrection. And uh, I'm going to have hair. I, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, you know, it's going to be brown. You know, it's going to be awesome. I don't know that. I'm just guessing. Maybe actually everyone will be bald. Maybe that's the maybe that's the apex. Maybe that's the final, you know, state of perfection. Go, go towards that. I don't know. But we're gonna have a, we're gonna have a resurrection body. And uh, the difference between this glorifying God and seeking glory from God is the difference between making God look like what He really is and making us into what we're definitely not. That's from John Piper. It's not that we're changing to become a God. It's that we are made in his image and we become conformed to his image. And when God does that, when he takes all of us Christians and makes us look more like Christ, he's glorified because he has now created us in his image and now we really look like his image. We attain to that through the resurrection. Not supremely valuable like God, but conform to the image of Jesus Christ. Jesus is glorious because he's the Son of God. He is glorious. He's greater than Moses, more glory than Elijah. He is our Savior, and we worship him because he is going to make us glorified when we are conformed to the image of Jesus Christ so that we might worship God. Beholding the glory of Jesus Christ, how do we do that? Do we have to go to this mountain? Do we have to go find the mountain that, by the way, the, the mountain is not named, that Jesus and the Peter, James, and John, it just says a high mountain. Somewhere in northern Israel, in the Galilee area. We don't know where this is. I think maybe that's by on purpose, because what would happen? If we knew which mountain it was, that they saw... Everybody be going to this mountain to try to find a pilgrimage to the mountain where Jesus' glory was there. You don't have to go to the mountain. You don't have to go to the promised land. You don't have to go to Jerusalem to find Jesus to see his glory, to behold his glory. You don't even have to go to seminary to behold the glory of Jesus. Although that may be a plan for you in the future. You know where you have to go? Right here. God's Word. We have the testimony of the disciples. We have God's own Word. And all of the Scripture points to Jesus Christ and His glory. And as we gaze upon the glory of Jesus Christ, we are transformed. We can't help but be transformed. So this is my application to you. From this passage. Behold the glory of Jesus Christ by immersing yourself in God's word. Behold the glory of Jesus Christ by immersing yourself in God's word. That means reading it. That means memorizing it. That means studying it. Talking about it. Praying through it. Using scripture and prayer. We sang Psalm 121 as a song. Singing it. Praying over scripture, asking God to, to uh, show us himself. You will see, as you read the Bible, you will gaze upon the glory of Jesus, and then you will be transformed. That verb means to metamorphosis, to be actually change form. Your form will change by reading scripture because you will see Jesus for who he is and you will be transformed by the Holy Spirit. And we talk a lot about prayer, care, and share this year. That will happen naturally as you see Jesus for who he is. You will have this desire to share the beauty of the Savior, the glory of Jesus Christ with those around you. You won't be able to hold it in. Jesus is going to have to tell you, stop, it's enough, stop, stop. It's like he told the disciples, wait until I rise, raise, rise uh, from the dead, rise from the dead. Well, he did, and, and they waited, and then they told. 
Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that the, by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what's good and acceptable and perfect. Renew your mind. Then don't undo the renew by the world. That's part of our problem. You're here, I'm preaching to the choir. We don't have a choir. But you are the choir. You're singing on Sunday morning. You're here. You're at church. You're not out doing something else. You're here. You're in the Word. You, that's why you came, to hear God's Word, to be with God's people, to, to sing. So keep doing that, and don't undo the renew. You, your mind's being renewed right now by the transforming power of the Word of God. You're seeing the glory of Jesus, and you're being transformed. Don't undo that renew by what you listen to, what you watch, what you see in the world. And continue that renewal through reading Scripture, memorizing Scripture, studying it, talking about it, praying it, singing it, praying over it. When we do that, we will see Christ for who He is. And when we see His glory, we will be transformed. And we will transform this world. And Mont 